So well, let me introduce Elizabeth Barton. Um, oh, that's great. <laughs> later. And um, Elizabeth, your work focuses on art quilts. And you're well known not only in the Athens area, but also all over the U.S. as an art quilter and a teacher. Before I start at anything at all, I like to get a, a very good sense of what I'm getting into. And before I started to learn how to drive, I checked out the car thoroughly, a 1932 Rover. This is beautiful England that everybody wants to visit because it's so green. <laughs> Do not adjust your screens. <laughs> Parts of it really are brown and gray, and that probably counts for my love of brown and gray. Here is a quilt I made based on street scenes just like that one. That was actually in Leeds, um, in the north of England. A photograph of my hometown, York, in the north of England, a medieval town. And there is the quilt I made based on that photograph. Uh, this quilt has a strange story. I actually made it in shades of green and brown and yellow. And it was so horrible, I threw the whole thing in a blue dye bath, completely forgetting that I had painted on gold paint, which, of course, resists the dye. <laughs> and the gold popped out, and it was quite magical. So it won a prize, and and got bought by the city of Decatur in Georgia. So the moral of the story here is, if you really dislike it, throw die at it. <laughs> uh, another photograph of my hometown, um, taken from the Roman walls, which surround the town at about 20 feet high, so you can get some really interesting angles of things. So the tower on the left is Roman, the buildings in the middle are Victorian, Gothic, and the cathedral behind the largest cathedral in Europe is about 10th century. The mm -hmm. so York Minster, yes. Ah, so we have a lady here who has been groveling around beneath the York <laughs> Minster. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to come and examine your bosom later, Barbara. <laughs> and just see what that artifact is. Um, so this is my sketch based on that photograph, and this is the quilt based on the sketch, based on the photograph. And that's generally how I work. Um, very often when I've made one quilt, I like the idea so much that I'll make another based on the previous one. So this was certain details of the previous slide. This is uh, chimney pots in Whitby in the north of England. Whitby is a town that Captain Cook sailed from to discover the South Pacific, taking with him various gifts for the Pacific Islanders, such as venereal disease, measles, uh, and he discovered a number of islands, including one called Australia. Um, but I like the chimney pots in Whitby, so there's my sketch, and here's the quilt. Now you can see on this one there's quite a lot of different patterns on the fabrics, and those patterns are created by various surface design techniques. I do paint or dye all my own fabrics. Um, I'm not uh, a very good customer at fabric shops because I prefer to make them myself. And many of these are made with various resists. The dye goes on in funny shapes and patterns. And again, I liked the chimney pot so much I had uh, made another quilt based on the same idea. This time I've got a little bit more artistic license in the chimney pot. This is a town called Helmsley, again in the north of England. What I liked about this photograph was the juxtaposition of shapes, the triangles and the rhomboid shapes. 
that seem to overlap each other. I really like it when you can look at the, the picture plane and compress it into just a, a bunch of, of unusual shapes. That's great for a quilt maker. That's what we like to do. There's a sketch based on the photograph. One of the things you can do with these sketches is uh, scan them into a computer and then with Photoshop or similar photo imaging programs, just flip them around upside down, change the ratios. And it's just amazing how you get a different sense of the place. You can get quite a different mood. So here we are making Helmsley much taller. Or even stretched out further. Or I could just take a detail of that and make a very abstract piece. So there's the first quilt I've made based on Helmsley. Uh, the sky is a shibori or tie-dye fabric. As, and there are several other tie-dye pieces in there. And I made a particular note of the direction of light, where the light was coming from, so I could get the darks and lights in there, create an atmosphere. Another quilt based on the same image, but a slightly different rotation, a different light and dark pattern, a different set of colors. A sketch, a quilt. A sketch. The quilt. So you can see the sketches aren't all that detailed. And when I first start to make the piece, I just block out the, sh the biggest shapes on a design wall and then add the details as I go along. This is the, one of the main squares in my hometown. This is the mansion house where the mayor lives. And if you notice, the architects got pretty bored by putting in the same kind of windows, so they changed the windows on every row. And in fact, that middle row has got two different kinds of windows. Not like today where they tell you, oh, if you buy a job lot of windows all the same, it will be cheaper. That's too boring. And the back of that building is uh, this medieval building where there's even more variation in windows. And here's the quilt I made based on all those different windows. And it hangs in Athens Regional Library. You can see it as you go up the stairs to the fiction section. Mm -hmm. And you, you'll see a, a, a similar one I made based on a similar yeah. idea. Now, the quilts are going to come down for the renovation because when I looked up, I realized they turned gray. And then as I looked in more closely, I realized the gray was long rolls of dust <laughs> teetering on the edge above the library patrons. So I've asked the head librarian to let me have them back. I don't know if I'll throw them into a bath of blue dye, but you never know. <laughs> Again, a picture of my hometown. I like this one because it's got the Roman section, the Roman gateway. It's got the medieval houses. Um, probably, uh, actually late medieval, probably 17th, 16th, 17th century. And then York Minster where Barbara found her artifact. <laughs> Barbara's sitting here in the audience wearing her artifact. Um, the York Minster is in the background. And these buses and vehicles, of course, are 20th century. And I didn't put them in the quilt. Um, but when I made the quilt, I'd also been to visit New York and seen the skyscrapers, and I like to sort of model people up. Um, are those edifices in the background great erections to honor some supreme power such as God? Or maybe they are erected to um, magnify the power of wealth as we see in the skyscrapers. I'll leave you to figure out that. A picture of York Marketplace with some of the medieval buildings with the beaming and the different windows. And there's a quote I based 
on that uh, on some of those old houses. I like the fact that the old houses have very wobbly lines, the windows are wobbly, the glass is unclear, different things reflect. I like the sense that are we looking out or are we looking in? What kind of mystery is happening behind those windows? This is one of the oldest streets in town, known as the Shambles. And notice that nice negative space with the sky and the beams on the buildings. I've done a lot of quilts based on this street. Uh, it isn't actually Newgate for anybody in York that happens to watch this. Um, it's one of uh, many quilts, and the first one was called The Shambles. I couldn't call all the others the same. Um, this is Durham in the north of England. Durham Castle and Cathedral sit on top of a granite mound and the little houses all cluster around. So again, there's that sense of, of compression of space, uh, which I was so fascinated by, I actually made four quilts based on it. This is one. These are quite big quilts, by the way. They're about five feet square. This is the second one. This is my daughter's favorite quilt. And I noticed that she's online, so that's great. Um, uh, she was always upset that I sold this quilt, but it did pay for a bunch of shelves and sinks and counters for me to continue dyeing fabric. <laughs> so Now, in this version of Durham, the fact that I'd been to New York again be almost begins to emerge, this sort of sense of Central Park and the gray skyscrapers behind, especially on this one. But it really was originally inspired by Durham. Um, our stations, as we know, are not exactly great for the environment. And some people think industrial buildings are pretty ugly, but there's a magic to them as well. There's the quilt I made, actually based not on that uh, free photo image, but on a photograph I took myself from the train. And in the train, the grasses in the field of canola were all sort of swished sideways by the speed of the train, which I, I really liked that image. Uh, back to Whitby. I, again, this photograph really appealed to me because of the way the shapes form different patterns. I made two quilts on it, changing the light. This one I emphasized the gate. In the previous one, it was the light on the wall. Uh, I'm going to go through a series of steps here so that you can see exactly how I carry out some of this. So this is a picture I took somewhere near Stratford. I don't remember. There's my sketch. Here I'm coloring in to get a sense of the color scheme I like. The, there was a post box or pillar box in front of the building, and I like that little dash of red, which echoes the red on the roof. And there's the quilt. And if you live in Athens, that quilt actually is hanging up in um, an antique shop on the corner of Hancock and Millage. And here we have beautiful Athens, Athens, Georgia. This is, this is one of my favorite buildings in Athens. I just love this place. It's, um, it's sort of behind Boulevard off of Chase Street. And there's the quilt I made based on it and had another go just in black and white. Now on this one, I deliberately printed sort of what you might call environmental or green um, in inverted commas fabric and used that to make the industrial building so that the, the contrast between the environment and the need for industrial buildings would be subtly intertwined. 
In fact, it's so subtle that most people don't even see it. But I know it's there. The uh, I'm told by a member of the audience that I can find some buildings in town that are uh, quite covered in vines. So this this is definitely reminiscent of the, the Kudzu era when Athens was the Kudzu capital of the world. Um, and this is another quilt based on the cement works. Um, what really appealed to me about the cement works was uh, uh, those gantries that run between the different storage towers. And that's the end of my pictures. I hope I haven't zonked through too quickly. And that's me on the right, having a glass of uh, Coke or Guinness, depending on your <laughs> inclinations. And I think that now we can throw it open to questions, right? Yes. Yes, so feel free, whether you're here or there, to ask questions. All right. Um, well, are there any questions here in the audience first? Ah, I'm asked if I have my sketchbook, not with me, but when you come to my house for the plein air um, uh, meeting, I can show you lots of sketches. What you were doing yesterday at the museum? Uh, one of the things you can do in Athens that's really great is we've got the art museum's been renovated, vastly extended, and um, I think it's about once a month. You can go in the evening, and there are little stools um, you can carry around with you, and you can and lots of inspiration. And you're quite right, Barbara. I was there yesterday getting some sketches from the Beverly Pepper sculptures that I think might make some really nice abstract quilts. Well, I see um, Julie Cannon. Hello there. Uh, can you hear me? Hmm. Oh, um, Julie, would you write your question on the Q&A panel down at the bottom here, please? You you haven't joined us on the audio part, and we can't hear you. But I see you have your hand up. And I've also got a smiley face there. Oh, oh and there's another hand up. All right. While she's doing that, Mary Kay, do you have a question? Yes. Um, you take just beautiful pictures out of town to base your, your quilts on. It's just gorgeous to watch those slides and see your real-life inspiration. Um, I wondered if you're inspired when you in your travels to um, do anything besides the buildings. Well, recently um, I've been taking pictures and trying to do watercolors. And at first I thought that's going to be the end of it. But now I've realized that I can use those watercolors to be inspirations for quilts. I have to translate them into more... Um, rigid shapes for the quilting. But I think it's it's going to be quite exciting and that's that's my new um direction that I'm going to take Mary Kay. But haven't got any to reveal to the public yet. Great, thank you. All right, Diane? How do you assemble your book? Once you have in your mind, you know what you said you had like a wall I, yes, I'm asked how I assemble. Um, I think the first thing when it comes to assembling a quilt is not to worry about it until the exact point that you begin. It's like climbing a mountain. You um, you, you wait till you're almost to the um, the cliff itself before you think what to do. It's good to have a, a lot of different techniques at your fingertips. Um, I do make the quilt um, step by step on a design wall, cutting out the fabric, placing the pieces on the wall. The wall is simply covered with batting or felt so that the pieces don't fall off. I can put them into the wall. Uh, I'm not looking forward to selling the house <laughs> because of all the little pin pricks in the walls. 
And when it looks right on the wall, vertically, then I take it down a little bit at a time, and I figure out the easiest way to sew it together at that point. So sometimes it's piecing, uh, sometimes it's applique, uh, sometimes it's um, a different kind of applique where you just layer everything on top of itself and go over with a sewing machine and over and over and over. Um, but it's all held together by stitches. I don't use glue or anything like that. Um, there are quite a lot of quilters that do glue things together. But when I start to think about using glue, it somehow leaps onto the iron. <laughs> and then it leaps onto me. <laughs> and then it leaps onto everything in the place. Um, so I use stitching to sew it all together. Um, Claire O'Water, do you have a question? Yes, and now I'm typing it because I was frustrated. I couldn't manage to type it, but I figured out how to do it. So um, let me try that just to see how it works. I doubt a bit wonder how. Push the send button after you've typed it. Well, I'm almost finished because I'm doing it with one hand since my other hand is holding the phone. Uh, okay, now I'm going to hit send and see how quickly you get it. All right. We've got it here. Okay, um, good. All right, yes. We're asked, do I start with a white sheet? I start with white fabric. Um, I buy fabric 100 yards at a time, white cotton. Um, but not a sheet because sheets usually have too high of a thread count. Uh -huh. And you'd never get a sewing machine through them very easily. Ah. So do you order it online, the fabric that you like? Yes. Yes, I, I must admit I'm pretty much an online shopper. I, I really don't like shopping in reality. People ask me how come I have time to make as much as I make, basically because I don't go shopping ever. <laughs> um, and then what kind of dyes do you like? Do you, the dyeing, I mean, I'm, I'm so interested. Do you buy you? dyes? Do you go get, you know, organic stuff, or what do, how do, what do you do? Uh, I, I use synthetic dyes, fiber-reactive dyes. They're the fastest and the easiest to use. The problem with the natural dyeing, although they yield really beautiful colors, is that you still have to use a lot of mordants. Um, a lot of what? The mordants, things that make the uh, color actually adhere to the fabric. Fiber-reactive dyes form a molecular bond with the fabric, uh, and so it's very fast uh, in terms of it, it holds, holds to the fiber molecule very well. You don't have to use a lot of heat, so you're not using a lot of electricity, and if you mix it properly, you don't have a lot of chemicals to throw away because they're pretty much exhausted. Um, so I think it's reasonably environmental. There are three or four companies in America that dis distributed these dyes, and they actually were first uh, compounded in England um, mm. by Imperial Chemical. But uh, now you can get them both on the East and West Coast. The colors, you know, looking at the screen, I mean, the, are so vibrant. Do you have to dye it eight times to get such vibrancy? <laughs> Well, actually, I know a very, very well-known quilt maker in the U.S. who used, uses triple strength on the dyes uh -huh. to try and make her colors more intense, which is not very good for the environment because there's going to be an awful lot of dye still in the, in the rinse water that, that simply there wasn't a molecule for that little dye molecule. There wasn't a, a fabric molecule left. Um, so, no, I... I don't use uh, more than I should. The the colors are intense in part because I do use a higher thread count cotton than oh. sort of cotton you would buy in most fabric stores. It's about 120, and most fabric stores are about 80 threads to the inch. But it's not the 300 threads to the inch of the sheet. Wow. But the more threads you've got, the more dye you can get on there. Well, it's. I just had workmen come to the door, so I'm going to scoop Elizabeth. Uh, it's gorgeous. I mean, just 
gorgeous and I have more questions, but isn't it nice other people can ask questions because I'm going to let my electricians in and I'll join you back in a minute. Uh, okay, bye. Great. Well, I have a question too. That's all right. Um, I want to know when you get your idea for a quilt, um, it, do you go out dyeing at that point or do you have a store of fabrics and you kind of see what what I have and what you need to do? I think more the latter. It's Sometimes you're in dyeing mode and sometimes you're in stitching mode. But I do know that you can do it either way. And there is a very famous quilter, Jan Myers Newbury, who told us that her stash was no more than one shelf of a small bookcase. Trying to, to make dinner with a packet of tables. <laughs> there. All right. Well, another question from the audience. Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit about your quilting or stitching on the Hopton uh, postcard? It looks like there's some hand stitching. Yes. Now I I I showed. Um, there's a picture of a quilt called Electric Fields, and it's on my website. It's got a lot of green at the bottom, and there are the cooling towers across the top. And to make that quilt, first of all, I shibori dyed the green piece of fabric at the bottom. I wrapped a piece of white uh, sateen, which is a slightly lower thread count, but has a nice sheen to it, um, cotton on a big pole, a really big pole and um, dipped it into dark green dye. And then I traveled around with that piece of fabric for months and stitched the heck out of it, hand-stitched. Um, there's just a huge amount of hand-stitching on it. And then I made the top bit with the towers and joined the two together, then layered it with batting um, and the backing piece. Uh, and machine quilted it but fairly discreetly because I wanted the hand stitching to be you know the foremost uh, thing that you could see the most evident and on the top right of that quilt um, there are the the pylons done in an embroidery stitch because you can see a lot of pylons taking the electricity away well, Elizabeth has got another question. All right, one more question. Okay. Do you use any three-dimensional embellishment? I don't. Um, I, I kind of think that I, I'm asked if I use three-dimensional embellishments. Um, I think that we've got enough. We've got enough jewels with the the shade, the light, and the shade, the color, the stitching. Um, and I must admit, I think of three-dimensional stuff as clart, <laughs> which is a good old English word that means you really probably don't need it on there. So it's jewels on top of jewels. But feel free to add <laughs> as much clart as you like. <laughs> no, but when it's when it's well done, when it's done very discreetly, um, it it can be really beautiful. But but I I, I haven't ever used it. Mainly, um, in in part, I don't like the aesthetic of it. But also, I've got a lot of arthritis in my hands, and I just couldn't hold those little things. Um, I don't know if you noticed. I even had trouble with the mouse. My hand was going to was cramping up. So the, the message from this is, though, don't let any physical disabilities deter you from quilting. Getting back to baby boomers, as as you as you get to boomering or booming, <laughs> whatever the verb is, um, with quilting you can find a way to do it anyway. Um, despite arthritis or failing eyesight, I think actually failing eyesight helps. I know it helps with watercolor painting. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Madeline. Yes, we have a term for that. It's called Monet eyes. Oh, okay. Monet. <laughs>